if you understood the nature of love, you would be able to accept feelings of hatred. Affirmation can include the expression of such strong emotions. Dogmas or systems of thought that tell you to rise above your emotions can be misleading, even in your terms somewhat dangerous. Such theories are based upon the concept that there is something innately disruptive, base, or wrong in man's emotional nature, while the soul is always depicted as being calm, quote-unquote perfect, passive, and unfeeling. Only the most lofty, blissful awareness is allowed. Yet the soul is above all a fountain of energy, creativity, and action that shows its characteristics in life precisely through the ever-changing emotions. Trusted, your feelings will lead you to psychological and spiritual states of mystic understanding, calm, and peacefulness. Followed, your emotions will lead you to deep understandings, but you cannot have a physical self without emotions any more than you can have a day without weather. In personal contact, you can be quite aware of an enduring love for another person and still recognize moments of hatred when separations of a kind exist that you resent because of the love you know is involved. In the same way, it is possible to love your fellow human beings on a grand scale, while at times hating them precisely because they so often seem to fall short of that love. When you rage against humanity, it is because you love it. To deny the existence of hate, then, is to deny love. It is not that those emotions are opposites. It is that they are different aspects and experienced differently. To some extent, you want to identify with those you feel deeply about. You do not love someone simply because you associate portions of yourself with another. You often do love another individual because such a person evokes within you glimpses of your own quote-unquote idealized self. The loved one draws your best from you. In his or her eyes, you see what you can be. In the other's love, you sense your potential. This does not mean that in a beloved person you react only to your own idealized self, for you are also able to see in the other the beloved's potential idealized self. This is a peculiar kind of vision shared by those involved, whether it be wife and husband or parent and child. This vision is quite able to perceive the differences between the practical and the ideal, so that in ascendant periods of love, the discrepancies in, say, actual behavior are overlooked and considered relatively unimportant. Love is, of course, always changing. There is no one permanent state of deep mutual attraction in which two people are forever involved. As an emotion, love is mobile and can change quite easily to anger or hatred and back again. Yet, in the fabric of experience, love can be predominant even while it is not static, and if so then, there is always a vision toward the ideal, and some annoyance because of the differences that naturally occur between the actualized and the vision. There are adults who quail when one of their children says, quote-unquote, I hate you. Often children quickly learn not to be so honest. What the child is really saying is, I love you so. Why are you so mean to me? Or, what stands between us and the love for you that I feel? The child's antagonism is based upon a firm understanding of its love. Parents, taught to believe that hatred is wrong, do not know how to handle such a situation. Punishment simply adds to the child's problem. If a parent shows fear, then the child is effectively taught to be afraid of this anger and hatred before which the powerful parent shrinks. The young one is conditioned, then, to forget such instinctive understanding and to ignore the connections between hatred and love. Now, often you are taught not only to repress verbal expression of hate, but also told that hateful thoughts are as bad as hateful actions. You become conditioned so that you feel guilty when you even contemplate hating another. You try to hide such thoughts from yourself. You may succeed so well that you literally do not know what you are feeling on a conscious level. The emotions are there, but they are invisible to you because you are afraid to look. To that extent, you are divorced from your own reality and disconnected from your own feelings of love. These denied emotional states may be projected outward upon others, 
an enemy in war, a neighbor. Even if you find yourself hating the symbolic enemy, you will also be aware of a deep attraction. A bond of hate will unite you, but the bond was originally based upon love. In this case, however, you aggravate and exaggerate all those differences from the ideal and focus upon them predominantly. In any case, all of this is consciously available to you. It requires only an honest and determined attempt to become aware of your own feelings and beliefs. Even your hateful fantasies, left alone, will return you to a reconciliation and release love. A fantasy of beating a parent or a child even to death will, if followed through, lead to tears of love and understanding. Affirmation means acceptance of your own miraculous complexity. It means saying yes to your own being. It means acquiescing to your reality as a spirit in flesh. Within the framework of your own complexity, you have the right to say no to certain situations, to express your desires, to communicate your feelings. If you do so, then in the great flow and sweep of your eternal reality, there will be an overall current of love and creativity that carries you. Affirmation is the acceptance of yourself in your present as the person that you are. Within that acceptance, you may find qualities that you wish you did not have or habits that annoy you. You must not expect to be quote-unquote perfect. As mentioned earlier, your ideas of perfection mean a state of fulfillment beyond which there is no future growth and no such state exists. Quote-unquote, love your neighbor as yourself. Turn this around and say, love yourself as you love your neighbor. For often you will recognize the goodness in another and ignore it in yourself. Some people believe there is a great merit and holy virtue in what they think of as humility. Therefore, to be proud of oneself seems a sin, and in that frame of reference, true affirmation of the self is impossible. Genuine self-pride is the loving recognition of your own integrity and value. True humility is based upon the affectionate regard for yourself, plus the recognition that you live in a universe in which all other beings also possess this undeniable individuality and self-worth. False humility tells you that you are nothing. It often hides a distorted, puffed-up, denied self-pride, because no man or woman can really accept a theory that denies personal self-worth. Fake humility can cause you to tear down the value of others, because if you accept no worth in yourself, you cannot see it in anyone else either. True self-pride allows you to perceive the integrity of your fellow human beings and permits you to help them use their strengths. Many people make a great show out of helping others, for example, encouraging them to lean upon them. They believe this to be a quite holy, virtuous enterprise. Instead, they are keeping other people from recognizing and using their own strengths and abilities. Regardless of what you have been told, there is no merit in self-sacrifice. For one thing, it is impossible. The self grows and develops. It cannot be annihilated. Usually, self-sacrifice means throwing the quote-unquote burden of yourself upon someone else and making it their responsibility. A mother who says to her child, I gave up my life for you, is speaking nonsense. In basic terms, such a mother believes, no matter what she says, that she did not have much to give up, and the quote-unquote giving up gave her a life that she wanted. A child who says, I gave up my life for my parents and devoted myself to their care, means, I was afraid to live my own life, and afraid to let them live theirs, and so in giving up my life, I gained the life I wanted. Love does not demand sacrifice. Those who fear to affirm their own being also fear to let others live for themselves. You do not help your children by keeping them chained to you, but you do not help your aged parents either by encouraging their sense of helplessness. The ordinary sense of communication given you through your creaturehood, if spontaneously and honestly followed, would solve many of your problems. Only repressed communication leads to violence. The natural force of love is everywhere within you, and the normal methods of communication are always meant 
to bring you in greater contact with your fellow creatures. Love yourselves and you do yourselves just honor, and you will deal fairly with others. When you say no or deny, you also do so because in your mind and feelings, a present situation or a proposed one falls far short of some ideal. The refusal is always in response to something that is considered, at least, to be a greater good. If you do not have too rigid ideas of perfection, then ordinary denial serves a quite practical purpose. But never negate the present reality of yourself because you compare it to some idealized perfection. Perfection is not being, for all being is in a state of becoming. This does not mean that all being is in a state of becoming perfect, but in a state of becoming more itself. All other emotions are based on love, and in one way or another they all relate to it, and all are methods of returning to it and expanding its capacities. Now, throughout this book, I have purposely stayed away from the word love because of various interpretations often placed upon it, and because of the errors frequently committed in its name. You must first love yourself before you love another. By accepting yourself and joyfully being what you are, you fulfill your own abilities, and your simple presence can make others happy. You cannot hate yourself and love anyone else. It is impossible. You will instead project all the qualities you do not think you possess upon someone else, do them lip service, and hate the other individual for possessing them. Though you profess to love the other, you will try to undermine the very foundations of his or her being. When you love others, you grant them their innate freedom and do not cravenly insist that they always attend you. There are no divisions to love. There is no basic difference between the love of a child for a parent, a parent for a child, a wife for a husband, a brother for a sister. There are only various expressions and characteristics of love and all love affirms. It can accept deviations from the ideal vision without condemning them. It does not compare the practical state of the beloved's being with the idealized perceived one that is potential. In this vision, the potential is seen as present, and the distance between the practical and the ideal forms no contradiction, since they coexist. Now, Sometimes you may think that you hate mankind. You may consider people insane, the individual creatures with whom you share the planet. You may rail against what you think of as their stupid behavior, their bloodthirsty ways, and the inadequate and short-sighted methods that they use to solve their problems. All of this is based upon your idealized concept of what the race should be, your love for your fellow man, in other words. But your love can get lost if you concentrate upon those variations that are less than idyllic. When you think you hate the race most, you are actually caught in a dilemma of love. You are comparing the race to your loving idealized conception of it. In this case, however, you are losing sight of the actual people involved. You are putting love on such a plane that you divorce yourself from your real feelings and do not understand the loving emotions that are the basis for your discontent. Your affection has fallen short of itself in your experience because you have denied the impact of this emotion for fear that the beloved, in this case the race as a whole, will not measure up to it. Therefore, you concentrate upon the digressions from the ideal. If instead you allowed yourself to free the feeling of love that is actually behind your dissatisfaction, then it alone would allow you to see the loving characteristics in the race that now escape your observation to a large degree.